Hi everyone, welcome to the NCEA's first of our pre-recorded video lecture series, How Does Elder Abuse Impact Latinx Communities? My name is Eden and I'm the Operations Director at the National Center on Elder Abuse that operates out of the Keck School of Medicine of the University of Southern California. I'm joined here today by my colleagues Alexis Galleros and Alicia Cisneros. It's our pleasure to share with all of you what we know about elder abuse and how it's impacting our very diverse communities. Elder abuse is already a serious public health and human rights issue that erodes older people's safety and dignity. And research even suggests that culture could be both a risk and a protective factor associated with A&E. Culture affects how people perceive and define elder abuse, and it can create a number of linguistic, cultural, social, and institutional barriers in not only reporting abuse, but also seeking help. This also impacts how professionals and authorities engage people in need of assistance. This lecture will discuss the importance of considering cultural competence to build sturdy interventions, support services, and prevention resources that acknowledge multicultural perspectives on abuse, neglect, and exploitation. So let's go ahead and get started. Today, we have several objectives with our time here in mind. We'll tell you what we know about elder abuse, what forms of abuse are occurring within our communities. We'll share some elder abuse research about Latinx subgroups that may have been studied so that you could hear more about some of the risk and protective factors for elder abuse that we are aware of. We'll then tell you about strategies to reach and engage older adults from Latinx communities and some prevention strategies that you may choose to employ. And finally, resources. At our center, we've created a multitude of resources that are all available for you to utilize when elder abuse allegations are being brought to your attention. And you need to know about what to do and where to turn to for help. And we'll be providing you with a number of web links that you could access for free too, so keep that in mind. If you haven't heard of us before, the National Center on Elder Abuse Grant was awarded to the Keck School of Medicine of USC in September of 2014, which is where we're stationed out of in Los Angeles County, California. So what is the NCEA? It's one of many federally funded resource centers that was established by the Administration on Aging and Administration for Community Living. And just to give you a bit of background, they've created other resource centers that, for instance, specialize in providing legal technical assistance, disability rights, long-term care ombudsman programs, adult protective services, and many other topics. And we see ourselves as the go-to experts on all general information um, related to research findings and resources related to elder abuse, neglect, and exploitation. And in terms of what the importance is of our work, it could be best described through our goal and mission statement. Our center's aim is to help professionals and the public prevent, detect, and respond to elder maltreatment. Our goals are to gather, publish, and disseminate research. We also maintain a repository of materials. We compile, publish, and disseminate trainings for professionals like this. We provide expert technical assistance and information and referrals. And we conduct research and implement model projects on elder maltreatment. You can turn to the NCEA for all of the most current resources, educational tools, news and awareness campaign materials. So you'll receive some more information regarding our websites at the close of this webinar. All the work that we're accomplishing at the NCEA would not be possible without our partners. Over the years, we've had um, many partnerships with organizations and agencies that are not inclusive of everyone that we've partnered with. But if you look to the right of the screen here, you'll see a lot of our recurring and newer emerging partners. Collaboration is key and it's important to every aspect of what we're accomplishing. We truly find at our resource center that there's strength in numbers. And we always think to ourselves, why tackle something on our own when we know we could do it better and reach more people through joint initiatives? I'd love to share with you briefly what we're up to with some of these partners. And then towards the end of our presentation, we're going to call out specific resources and initiatives for you to take a closer look at. Alongside the consumer voice, we've been educating the public on sexual abuse and long-term care. We're currently working on wrapping up a neglect fact sheet. We've partnered on workshops to get information out about the opioid 
crisis, and we've even created some very helpful checklists for family members and caregivers to consider on what makes sense in terms of reuniting and moving family members back home. Along with NAPCA, we in the past had developed some culturally relevant materials in as many as six different Asian languages, and those were even vetted through focus groups on topic areas such as financial exploitation, emotional abuse, neglect, and caring for a loved one with dementia. And we thought it was time to revisit that partnership and consider creating some more multi-language fact sheets. So we'll be starting that work and embarking on that new journey this year. Another membership organization in the right hand corner, NAPSA. We've created some very helpful APS oriented materials. We created a very extensive brief and slide set to educate people about what current mandatory reporting laws exist. And we not only design those pieces for APS trade members, but we also create these fact sheets so that people know what APS can do and when potentially a case might get closed. Um, alongside SAGE, we have developed LGBT inclusive materials, really empowering pieces for professionals and community members. And we've promoted those materials through national webinars. Um, when things resume in person, we are planning on doing some in-person outreach events. And they even came on board to assist us with updating the content on our LGBT elders research brief that we created many years ago. With the support of the University of North Dakota, we've developed some pieces for tribal communities that explain concepts like spiritual abuse, two spirits. Um, we've also created resources for caregivers, um, pieces that explain what consent, excuse me, uh, capacity, intimate partner violence, medication issues are, and some other very relevant, prominent topics that we wanted to be sure to, to get out to communities so that they're aware of the challenges that tribal communities face. Alongside with the Elder Justice Coalition, we've been working on developing a who's who fact sheet to educate our audience about bipartisan legislators that we should be paying attention to. And we got that piece out, um, or the first version of that piece earlier this month. Um, finally, we're members of the National Guardianship Network and we participated in the National Guardianship Summit and that was convened back in May through Syracuse Law. And a few members of our team even served as delegates in working groups that helped to develop a list of recommendations for both reform and improvement around the theme of maximizing autonomy and ensuring accountability of guardianship. Um, and finally, two other organizations that we will be um, creating some products with are Esperanza United that focuses on serving Latinx communities and the Interfaith Partnership as well. Again, just some highlights in case you're interested in learning more about our partners. So working with distinct populations, it is important to take into consideration the proper terminology associated with that population. Plus, using proper terminology is a sign of respect and can help affirm an individual or group identity, overall helping to establish that mutual trust with clients or for people or even a cause you're advocating for. And this includes using correct pronouns, which help promote a safe and welcoming place of acceptance. The Hispanic identity, for example, can be interpreted as an ethnic term, acknowledging cultural ties back to Spanish heritage so overall, just putting in a little effort to know and better understand who you are working with. Some additional terminology we would like to highlight as we take a deeper dive into the materials today are the terms Latino and Latinx. You may be thinking, what's the difference? Why put an X at the end? Well, Latino refers to Latin American descent blending Native American, African, and Spanish heritage. The X in Latinx is a gender neutral term sometimes used instead of Latino or Latina to refer to people of Latin American culture or ethnic identity in the United States. In the Spanish language, many words are assigned with an A or an O ending to identify masculine or feminine genders. What is it that we know about elder abuse? Let's talk statistics. Connected back to elder abuse, 
it continues to grow at such an exponential rate, especially in light of the resurgence of cases like what we witnessed over the summer related to the COVID-19 pandemic. Know that elder abuse remains vastly underdetected and underreported, and it continues to increase at an alarming rate, and this is due to several factors. Social isolation reigns supreme, leading risk factor for abuse occurring. Also, the lack of access to supports and resources, and finally, someone perhaps having unmet physical, mental, or emotional needs. All of these factors coupled can really lead to someone experiencing elder abuse. And in terms of our best estimates, one in 10 people over the age of 60 year abuse are neglected each year. And based on some recent research, that was done on a global level, the numbers are even expected to be one in five or even one in six people that on a global level may have experienced abuse or neglect or exploitation in a year. And recognize that elder abuse affects communities on many levels. It's not just about affecting public health, but it also um, may affect people's civic participation and economic resources that go to combating different forms of abuse like sexual assault or financial fraud. And what some people don't realize is that the cost of elder abuse are high for the affected individuals into our society. Older people's losses could be tangible, so think about the loss of a home and life savings being liquidated and intangible, someone's dignity, their independence, possibly their lives. And for society, it creates healthcare and legal costs, which are oftentimes shouldered by public programs like Medicare and Medicaid, and it reduces older people's participation in our communities. Also, there's an increased likelihood that if someone has experienced abuse in their childhood or they've been involved in domestic violence disputes, they may have been more prone to experiencing abuse in later years. Elder abuse is a global public health concern, and we all have a stake in preventing it from occurring in the first place. And it's all a matter of how we're translating that message. So you'll see these pie charts to the right. And they show you how diverse Latinx communities are in our country. Mexican Americans and Puerto Ricans represent the largest portions of the population. Therefore, they're the most studied populations. The Latinx population, I'll also have you know, is the largest minority group in the United States. You'll see in the bottom right hand corner that of the nearly 17% of the US population being age 65 and older, that 4.5 5 million are Latinx. This is why this topic and this angle on this topic of elder abuse and what we do know about Latinx communities is a very important subject to discuss. So another thing to consider would be the intersection of elder abuse and poverty. Poverty can be a risk factor for elder abuse because it can impact a person's health and their quality of care access to resources and you know other financial responsibilities. Here are a few Latinx identifying groups. Uh, according to the US Census Bureau, 16% of Colombians age 65 and older are in poverty, 28% of older adult Dominicans are in poverty, and 21% of Puerto Ricans 65 and older are also in poverty. Moving on to cognitive capacity and elder abuse, much of what we know is involved with research on Alzheimer's dementia impacting an older adult's decision making, um, which can open the doors to the different types of elder abuse. In institutional settings, cultural variables such as language, economic status, familial roles, and perceptions of institutions can impact assessing capacity. There are currently 6.2 million Americans uh, age 65 and older living with Alzheimer's dementia, equaling to one in nine older adults in America having Alzheimer's. Scams are rampant now and they're continuing to evolve at such a frequent pace. Traditionally, we've heard of older people grappling with things like the grandparent scam, which is very common among Latinx older people. And it's when 
an FBI or police agent from overseas calls pretending to have a niece or nephew or obviously a grandchild detained and they're requesting that that older person sends ransom in order to let that person go and come back to the United States. Um, there's also lottery scams where someone from Publishers Clearinghouse is pretending to um, call that older person on their landline and convince them that they've won a free cruise or vehicle and they're just requesting a down payment in order to process their claim. Also, Medicare fraud is real. Um, we'll go over a scenario shortly that highlights a romance scam, veteran scams. And thinking about the times that we're living in over the past 20 months with the COVID-19 pandemic, scammers have not been hesitating to target older people with a whole new host of scams. Um, I was even checking in with a colleague last Thanksgiving and they told me that they even, even experienced a scam. Um, so know that they're continuing to be alive and, and continue to be prominent now. Um, scammers are even going lengths to pretend that they're from volunteer and charity centers. Um, we were even witnessing when the vaccines were rolling out or about to roll out that there were scammers pretending to have access to or early access to vaccines. Um, social security scams, bulk supply scams, offers for loan assistance. And what we really want to emphasize here as well with some of these prominent scams is that people should really be watching out through email and telephone. Scammers are even savvy enough to send text messages with links that have access to viruses or that send people to a very convincing replicated Bank of America page where they enter in their user ID and password and before you know it, there's potential for someone to experience scams. So um, in addition to all the many forms of scams and um, forms of abuse that you've been learning about through this lecture, understand that Latinos can specifically be targeted through these prominent scams. In our trainings, we always find it so helpful to walk through some example scenarios to show you how complex and elaborate these situations, including elder abuse, neglect, and exploitation can be. So let me tell you a little bit about a very relatable situation that happened to a gentleman by the name of Tomas. Tomas, age 70, retired five years ago and recently lost his wife to breast cancer. Hoping to restart his life after this difficult loss, he joined a dating website. One evening, Domas received a message from someone who presented herself as a younger woman named Marisol. She appeared to be a very attractive woman from her dating profiles in her 40s and a divorcee living in South America. And after just a few weeks, their correspondence had escalated from polite small talk to more intimate conversations. They began to talk daily. And one day, Marisol missed an evening of chatting online with Domas and he was upset. Marisol then appeared online and the following evening told him that her daughter had tragically been killed in a car accident and that she was actually stressed about her finances in addition to dealing with grief. Consumed by grief himself, Domas willingly offered to send her $45,000, which was sent by wire transfer. And after a few weeks had passed, she mentioned that she needed a new roof on her home and had to replace the car that was totaled in her daughter's accident. Domas then wired $65,000 more. So what happened in the end with this situation? Nearly a month after the death of Marisol's daughter, Domas begged her to come visit in Los Angeles. He desperately wanted to meet her in person and thought he had waited long enough to be with his love and be reunited. She accepted his offer, professing her uh, love for him, and Tomas, as a result, wired her even more money to purchase a first class round trip ticket. And he also promised that he would meet her at the airport. 
On the evening that Marisol was set to arrive, Tomas made sure everything was in place. Then, as his sweetheart Marisol was to arrive at the baggage claim, Tomas began to worry. His heart suddenly filled with uncontrollable sadness because he realized she wasn't showing up. And there was no sign of any woman who ever even barely resembled her. Not only was he unable to reach her by phone, but he couldn't reach her by email or text. And in the moments, hours, and days that followed, he was devastated by the emotional deception and the loss of over $100,000. So I hope in hearing this situation, you're able to reflect back on the signs here and what to really pay attention to in terms of issues and having this online romance when you've never met a person before. Very obvious signs of financial exploitation here. majority of the current Latinx population being from immigrant descent, it is important to recognize the political tension between this marginalized population and the United States. Over time, historical tension has contributed to the stigmatization of the Latinx population and has influenced help-seeking behaviors within the community. The following are just a few key events. Uh, 1910 to 1917, the Mexican Revolution caused a surge of Mexicans to cross the U.S. border. March 2nd, 1917, President Wilson signs the Jones Shafroth Act, granting U.S. citizenship to Puerto Ricans. May 28th, 1924, Congress creates the Border Patrol. August 4th, 1942 to 1964, the U.S. and Mexico signed the Mexican Farm Labor Agreement called the Bracero Program. America's biggest guest worker program created to avoid labor shortages during the war. This controversial program allowed manual workers or braceros from Mexico to work in the United States short term, mostly in agriculture uh, with basic protections such as minimum wage, insurance, and free housing, although oftentimes these were all disregarded by their employers. June 9, 1954, President Dwight Eisenhower institutes Operation Wetback, a controversial mass deportation using a racial slur in which the government rounded up more than one million people to deport, and this lasted a few months due to funding running out. Then we have the Civil Rights Act of 1964 which outlawed discrimination based on race, sex, religion, color, or national origin. It produced the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission to enforce federal job discrimination laws. And one immediate effect of the act was an end to segregated facilities requiring Black Americans and Mexican Americans to use only designated areas. In 1965, the Older Americans Act in the U.S. Uh, provides a range of support to older adults, um, such as community-based services for older adults, nutrition programs, in-home services, transportation, and elder abuse prevention programs. And this created the Administration on Aging, or AOA, at the federal level, and the state's units on aging. So this was all to ensure protection against the abuse and neglect to the older adult population, creating the Prevention of Elder Abuse, Neglect, and Exploitation Program. Following that, on April 20th, 1980, Fidel Castro announces that Cuban citizens may immigrate to Florida from the Port of Mariel with their own arranged boat transportation. Uh, in the months that follow, 125,000 Cubans fleed the country in what came to be called as the Mariel Boat Lift. November 6, 1986, Immigration Reform and Control Act was put into place, uh, granting 2.7 million long-term immigrants permanent legal status, but also imposing restrictions 
uh, increasing border security and making it illegal for employers to knowingly hire unauthorized workers. In 1991, the International Federation on Aging and Dominican Republic elaborated the Declaration of Rights and Responsibilities of Older Persons, which was pre presented to the United Nations and adopted as Resolution 46 and 91. The resolution approved the following principles in favor of older adults, such as independence or recognizing the right to access uh, to income, housing, medication, as well as education, participation, which is integrating older persons to society, care, uh, relevance of attention to health and well-being, resources and quality of life, self-accomplishment, which is access to social resources and opportunities to potential development, and dignity, so protection to security and not being mistreated. On June 23rd, 2016, in a one sentence ruling, the US Supreme Court announced it is equally divided in a case involving a lower court's decision to block President Barack Obama's 2014 executive immigration order, deferred action for parents of Americans and lawful permanent residents, or DAPA, DAPA, granting deportation relief to 4 million plus undocumented people living in the US, providing they pay taxes pass background checks, and reside in the country for more than five years. On June 18, 2020, in a 5-4 ruling, the U.S. Supreme Court blocks an attempt by a Trump administration to end the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, or DACA, program, uh, protecting immigrants who came to the country as children from being deported. Um, this was established in 2012 under President Obama, DACA protects 700,000 dreamers. Let's take some time to review barriers that research highlights as an increase to risk of abuse in the Latinx population. Some barriers that are shown to be recurring include limited support and preferred language, including social groups, community resources, and crisis support services that lowers engagement levels in these services access to financial resources due to factors such as citizenship status is also a big barrier to aging with dignity and respect and having access to, to access to tools for healthy daily living these financial impacts in turn lead to unconventional living arrangements in addition lack of training such as this one that we're having today creates gaps in cultural competency amongst professionals in the field working with older adults Another barrier to consider is historical tension or stigma associated with law enforcement and ICE. This prevents folks from reaching out for legal and emergency assistance. Barriers, but what makes these barriers so dangerous? Isolation is a big red flag for risk of abuse with older adults. These recurring barriers increase isolation because they cause folks to hesitate to communicate needs. Not communicating with your nuclear and community support systems can lead to self-reliant behaviors, which may escalate to neglectful behaviors, such as lack of engagement with healthcare treatment plans, distrust of community programs, such as financial caregiving and meal delivery service programs, and increased levels of dependence on a singular person, such as a family member, which then can lead to burnout or risk of being taken advantage of. So cultural values and beliefs can be risk factors for abuse, and depending on the individual, a person's overall perception of and or threshold for abuse can be different and even influenced by their cultural background. And a few examples of this are seen in favoring a family caregiver and in home care. Majority of the time, the abuser is a family member and caregiver stress is a real thing and can lead to abuse despite the situation starting off with better intentions. Uh, beliefs can influence a person's help-seeking behavior. They might have a strong distrust in law enforcement or government services or any services. Um, there might be too strong of a reliance on their internal networks as well. Then we have power differentials 
in Latinx communities, there is a strong presence of machismo or pride in being male, which impacts the family's dynamics and can ultimately lead to the normalization of abuse in domestic situations um, if they were to occur in the home. Then we have acculturation or assimilation to more dominantly present cultures. Um, this could be seen in Latinx communities where third or fourth generations, for example, do not uphold more common traditions like caring for the elderly within the family, leading to putting their elders in care facilities, which can be seen as not only unorthodox, but can also lead to abuse within the facility. Cultural beliefs can also pre present themselves as protective factors, not just risk factors. They could discourage other behaviors or decisions that can lead to abusive scenarios. Um, family, for example, that interdependence can be beneficial and reassuring. Uh, familial bonds can provide individuals with community and safety. And then community being a protective factor, the reliance on other members within the Latinx community can reinforce safety and even lead to more reliable resources. For spirituality and resilience, um, it helps reinforce other protective factors like community and familialism and other supportive relationships that can protect an older adult from abuse. What have your experiences been with services, whether providing services or you or a family member receiving services? Did you have access to the tools that you needed? Were the services culturally competent? Research shows that recurring risk factors for abuse pair with training gaps within agencies. If we look at language barriers, a quick fix, such as direct translation of materials, is insufficient to address the problem. Rather, to address this training gap, the intervention or assessment model needs to be tailored for the community you are working with, in this case, Latinx older adults. The information needs to be clear, sensitive of cultural norms or protective factors, and it needs to be reliable. Research has shown English assessments can generate unreliable results when translated and can be insensitive, which may harm the line of trust required to complete an intake. Looking into risk factors and help-seeking behavior, meaning the steps that people take to get help if they may experience a threat to their well-being. Older members of Latinx communities, and you may hear us re-emphasizing these points here, they may be unaware of the option of reporting abuse anonymously. They may be concerned that they'll not be treated with respect by professionals. They may feel the need to defend the family member um, or abuser. The fear of retaliation from an abuser is real as well. Perhaps that abuser is their caregiver or they rely on that abuser to take them to doctor's appointments, to go grocery shopping, to take care of matters with social security or other benefits allocation. Um, also the fear um, is real within our communities that reporting will lead to incarceration and incarceration is stigmatized due to poor experiences with law enforcement and this also can really create an even larger sense of distrust in that older person with um, law enforcement and, and justice um, connections and Finally, the Latino elder may not want to be brought to a place where prosecution is inevitable because it may have a greater impact on the family. So in terms of um, help seeking behavior, these are all very real scenarios that members of our community face. Make no assumptions. The older person is always the expert on their own culture and beliefs. And always keep in mind all of really what we've already been discussing today, that culture, language, fear of authorities, living arrangements, they all impact perceptions on elder maltreatment and how a person might obtain existing services from either connections that they had to service providers or that they're seeking out from new service providers. Um, and it can also um, 
impact where those older people are turning to for help. So what policies should agencies adopt and promote um, in their workplace? The first step we can take to address engagement and services is to ensure agencies have policies that enforce culturally competent services. Culture along with factors such as language barriers, fear of authorities, and living arrangements impact how older adults perceive mistreatment, their knowledge of support services, and willingness to report mistreatment and engage in recovery resources. So definitely impacts all of that. Uh, some steps to consider when assessing mistreatment of Latinx older adults include to first explore the survivor's degree of collective self or commitment to the abuser. So how much of their resources do they share and how much, how do they feel about uh, sharing resources with their abuser? Two, reviewing with the older adults the cultural context of mistreatment. So how do they perceive uh, abuse within their culture? What is culturally acceptable versus unacceptable? Three, assess the likelihood of reception to outside intervention. For example, an uh, outside practitioner may bring vergüenza or uh, translated to embarrassment to the victim and the family if they seek the outside service. And four, um, observe subtle behaviors that are indicative of psychological abuse and neglect. When thinking about updating assessments and intervention techniques to be culturally competent, think about opportunities for community outreach or collaboration with institutions. Or consider opportunities for recruitment of cultural experts or participating in education regarding multilingual outreach efforts like this one today. Consider bilingual and multilingual service providers or collaboration among multiple groups, including professionals, families, and community leaders, such as FAST teams, elder fatality review teams, or MDTs. In your assessments, consider cultural differences to avoid and to keep from severing the line of communication between you and the client or their support systems. Remember to really work in those support systems so that you can identify a full picture of the case and risk factors versus protective factors impacting your client. Lastly, consider the translation of your materials and intake forms and their reliability when working with differing cultures. The pandemic has exacerbated gaps in care, motivating us in the aging advocacy community to adapt our practices to provide quality care during restrictions. The first highlighted issue that was quickly brought to our attention was the detrimental use of the term social distancing. Social distancing led to increased risks of isolation and limited outreach from support systems. We have been successful in encouraging our colleagues in the advocacy fields to use the term physical distancing instead. One word update can truly change the ability to engage with, engage with folks in the field. We'll touch on this a bit more later in the webinar. In the beginning of the pandemic, there was a true barrier to care due to restrictions to meet clients face-to-face, -face, which led to concerns regarding abuse occurring without report. After all, we can't catch everything from telephone visits and video chats. To adapt, easy to use reporting tools such as bookmarks, magnets, flyers, and stickers to mail or send out in care packages can ensure folks have access to know when and how to report abuse. In addition, when virtually conducting outreach, mobilizing protective factors such as multiple family members to assess cases and support has been helpful. Continuing to maintain safety for both those in the field, clients, and their families is essential to creating an environment where both you and the client can engage in the assessment and interventions effectively. Be sure to gauge the comfort of clients with distance, PPE availability, etc., before beginning your interviews. More research initiatives are needed in general, but they really need to focus on what we don't know. Um, first and foremost, we need more research in general studying populations. We don't know already enough about elder abuse. We especially need to know more research that focuses on Latinx communities too. And what we've shared here today with you is essentially what we need in broad strokes, and we just don't simply know enough. 
We also need validated models to build Spanish speaking interventions and family led interventions that can overcome language barriers and embrace pertinent cultural components. So I could probably go on and on about what it is that we need, but for starters, we just need a lot more research studying populations in general. Now, speaking of utilizing effective language in your communications, I promised you earlier in the webinar we would learn how to do so. The NCEA, in partnership with the Frameworks Institute, is disseminating research on how to engage with the community to discuss elder abuse effectively. Research found language that is paternalistic or highlights fatalism causes audiences to disengage with messaging. An example of this would be saying something like, the silver tsunami during the pandemic has made seniors vulnerable to abuse. A surge in cases is inevitable. Instead, research shows people are more likely to engage with you if you incorporate inclusive language and take a solutions-oriented approach to your communications. So instead, we can say something like, the pandemic has shown us how, to, how important community programs are for us to all age with dignity. We can all work together to ensure community systems such as transportation, meal services, and healthcare are accessible to prevent abuse during the pandemic. This shift in language keeps you from othering your clients and incorporating yourself or your organization into an accessible service, which in turn quickly strengthens the line of communication during your intake, allowing you to gather the necessary data you need to do your job. Here are some reminders of what we have discussed today in updating our assessments. There is a need to work on screeners and assessment tools that are accurately translated or adapted for this underserved population. Explore culturally competent evaluation and intervention tools that work for your organization and the Latinx populations you are working with. Consider the impacts of COVID that may be interfering with your ability to connect with clients face-to-face -face during the ongoing transitions. Use inclusive language such as physical distancing rather than social distancing. Remember, if you don't know, ask. <clears throat> as we wrap up today, I wanted to quickly retouch on the Reframing Elder Abuse Project I mentioned earlier in today's webinar. I gave you a quick introduction to the Reframing Elder Abuse Project, but there's so much more to learn. So I wanted to provide you with these links and resources so that you can explore on your own more about the Reframing Elder Abuse Project. The Talking Elder Abuse Toolkit is a great toolkit to dive in a little bit deeper on your own and go through different links to learn more about the Reframing Elder Abuse Project. The free online course is an online course to get certified in reframing elder abuse and being able to apply this communication style to your own messaging and community tools. And that's free with the code WE ADD 2021. The Reframing Aging Initiative is our sister project that focuses on reframing aging and ageism. I also recommend signing up for monthly tips. This is our e-newsletter that we send every month, once a month, to learn more about the most up-to-date information we have on reframing elder abuse and current concerns that uh, may be a risk to elder abuse in our communications and having people really engage uh, with, with the current resources available. Our PSA is a reframed video that you are welcome to utilize, and I recommend checking it out. This is a reframed video that helps us to understand how to take on um, a productive messaging and using a justice narrative in our communications to really engage folks with a solutions-oriented approach on elder abuse. I've also included here our reframed materials that you are welcome to utilize, the red flags of abuse, facts about elder abuse, and 12 things everybody can do to prevent elder abuse that so you're welcome to print out and provide uh, your clients or colleagues. Lastly, the support for tools of elder abuse prevention toolkit, also known as our STEEP toolkit, is a toolkit that is ready for you to put your logo on and send out. It's reframed and has all the red flags of abuse and of important numbers for reporting abuse. And you can find all these resources at the links provided here.
Alicia just went over a comprehensive set of resources that includes the mission and tenets of the reframing elder abuse messaging strategy. And at the NCEA, we have a whole lot more to offer in addition to that. In the left-hand column, you'll see that we have some research briefs, and these highlight mistreatment research on not only Latinx elders, but we have briefs that focus on sharing research among African Americans, Asian Pacific Islanders, LGBT elders, research about ageism, and some new topics that we're working on. And this snapshot is the front cover page for our Latinx elders mistreatment brief. We've gone through the process of refreshing the content on a periodic basis, so please continue to check our website and see what new and updated information is reflected on these briefs. And to the right, you'll see the languages that we have to offer a lot of our public facing fact sheets in. We're currently expanding our portfolio of translated materials and most recently we added some even more languages to our repertoire, including pieces that are translated in Russian, Armenian, and Farsi. Having materials translated in languages with relevant concepts that people understand is so important to help us spread the message about elder abuse. Not only is it about going through the process of translating the materials, but making sure that the translations are dialect appropriate. Um, they also have to reflect appropriate reading levels and include concepts that are easily understandable and relatable. Many Latinx communities have roots and are connected with indigenous and tribal communities of North, Central, and South America. Another helpful collection of research-oriented pieces to highlight are some of the collection of American Indian and Alaska Native resources that we recently created with our partners at the National Indigenous Elder Justice Initiative and the University of North Dakota. At the NCEA, we felt we had a lot to learn about tribal communities, so for the past two years we decided to team up with this group led by Dr. Jackie Gray, and we've honestly learned a great deal in this experience. Um, for instance, among indigenous and tribal elders, we've learned about a concept called spiritual abuse that might not be recognized by the general public. And what spiritual abuse may look like from a tribal elder may include abuse from not only a trusted spiritual figure, but it may be the fact that a family member or another person in that older person's life is not giving access to sacred ceremonies um, for that elder to take advantage of. Or perhaps that elder is being barred from or not having um, or receiving rides to very important ceremonial practices. Um, also, spiritual abuse might look like someone throwing out or damaging uh, ceremonial objects. So it really was an eye-opening experience to work with this group. Um, we've also created a number of other tools that are very beneficial and, and useful information, especially for people that don't even know about the different forms of abuse, but it just opened our eyes and we hope that it opens others' eyes to some other noteworthy topics and um, areas of research. We worked with Niji and UND to also create a piece on the concept of two spirits that talks about how LGBT elders are respected figures within their tribes. And we collaborated with them to develop an array of other fact sheets based on topics um, that connect back to their pharmaceutical training modules. Um, and that connects to potentially overuse and underuse of medications. And finally, we've created some other pieces on caregiving, financial exploitation, and a whole host of other topics. So please go to our websites and check these out. The creation of communicating with people with limited English proficiency emerged from what we have all learned within our NCEA team and our experience with providing information and referral services. Over the years, we've been in contact with people who speak not only Spanish, but Chinese, Korean, Slavic languages, Arabic, Indian, you name it. And Internally, we're very fortunate to have a very culturally diverse team. And some of us speak other languages, some of us don't, and that's okay. 
So what it prompted us to do was create this fact sheet full of tips that you see off to the right here. And we hope that what it'll do is help you build rapport with people. And we want people to feel comfortable warming up to you. So some of the key points and highlights of this piece that may or may not be obvious to you when communicating with people. Um, and these are what we consider as essential practice tips. Consider offering contact options such as phone, email, or handwritten correspondence. When communicating by phone, many people with limited English proficiency have difficulty explaining what it is that they need and oftentimes find it easier to elaborate in writing. So just a, a first point to consider. If you have the ability to and it works with your program budgets, consider onboarding professionals who speak more than one language. And if your budgets are tight and volunteers or students are appropriate in your work setting and there's no real concern, well, in all of our um, environments, there's concerns for confidentiality, but just make sure that you check in with your legal and human resource department and that it wouldn't be an issue um, having volunteers or students be involved in this important work. Um, and explore options potentially through a local university, a social work program, law program, or a criminal justice program. Um, I know within our school at USC, we have wonderful relationships with different schools through the Keck School of Medicine and also through the University of Southern California campus. We have ties to the School of Gerontology, the School of Public Policy, and periodically we will have um, students come in and assist us with translation oriented projects. So see if that's available for you. Also, encourage people to take advantage of the many free mobile apps to use. Just make sure that you're doing a security screening and these could be things that are utilized not only in a computer but on a telephone. If someone is going out and making site visits, um, you could take advantage of downloading those if it's appropriate and it works within your IT parameters. Or perhaps you may just want to consider using Google Translate and um, taking advantage of other Google Suite options. Not only is it helpful for when you're traveling, but it also can help you communicate effectively with someone where you might not speak their first language. And finally, very important, always, always, always address people with appropriate titles, such as Miss, Mr., Elder, or whatever they determine to be the most appropriate salutation. It may be something, in fact, that signifies honor and respect to that older person and could be very important to them. So it should be taken seriously by you. So another great resource to consider is the Elder Abuse Guide for Law Enforcement. Don't let the name fool you, though, because it can be used by anyone. So starting with our Elder Abuse Overview section, uh, we house three by five flashcard style overviews for each type of elder abuse its definitions and signs for the types, along with questions to consider and actions that you can take if abuse is suspected. Uh, in our law enforcement resources tabs, we have several tools that can assist in developing a case of elder abuse. We have a bruising identification chart, our senior abuse financial tracking tool developed by the Department of Justice, otherwise known as SAFTA, photography tips for documentation, and much more under that tab. For state-specific laws, EGLE provides you with a list of each state's penal codes, their statutes regarding elder abuse in that state and your state's official definitions of mandated reporting, as well as who those mandated reporters are. Law enforcement that we've interviewed found this tool especially helpful when remembering charges. Investigators have used this to track down state legislation in regard to elder abuse, and community members and advocates use this tool to become more knowledgeable about state laws and statutes surrounding elder abuse, so very versatile in terms of use. Some other key resources are readily available on our homepage, as displayed right here. Uh, versatile tools for law enforcement, adult protective services, and other disciplines. They include our first responders checklist, evidence collection checklist, and our community resource referral tool. Checklists were developed to identify possible red flags for different types of elder abuse, in addition to providing you a list on what to really look out for while interviewing witnesses or older adults. The community resource referral tool is powered by Elder Care Locator. So with just your zip code, you are given a list of local service agencies and their contact information. 
And Eagle does offer multiple training opportunities if you were interested. Uh, one hour Eagle self-guided training and Eagle guided virtual training. So we would be on Zoom uh, guiding you through Eagle and different scenarios of elder abuse and an in-person Eagle training. And then our one hour self-guided training is through the National White Collar Crimes Center or NW3C. And that is IATLA certified and can be redeemed for post credit if you are law enforcement. Thank you for watching and we hope you found the information valuable. If you have any questions or comments, please reach out. You can contact us through the website at ncea.acl.gov or directly by email at ncea-info at aoa.hhs.gov or through our helpline at 1-855-500-3537. And any citations are available by request. Thank you.